Hello and welcome to the Aviatrix Book Review. I'm Liz Booker. Last year for Women's History Month, I highlighted the women who flew for their countries during World War II through a series of interviews with authors whose works featured the women Air Force service pilots, the British Air Transport Auxiliary, and the Russian night witches and the women who flew for Hitler. This year, I'm highlighting the women who participated in Dr. Randall Lovelace's astronaut tests in the early 1960s. My guest today is an historian with a passion for space flight. She is the host of the Vintage Space blog and YouTube channel where she explores the wonderful world of mid-century history and technology with a focus on space. She has also launched an exploration into U.S. history she calls A Canadian Learns America. She is the author of two books, Breaking the Chains of Gravity, the story of space flight before NASA, and Fighting for Space, Two Pilots and Their Historic Battle for Space Flight, which is the Aviatrix Book Club discussion book for March 2022. You can find her on her YouTube and social media at Amy Shira Title and at her website, amyshiratitle.com. And if you're a Super Mario Brothers fan and player, find her streaming on Twitch at The Space Vixen. Amy Shira Title, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be fun. <laughs> I'm so excited. So am I seeing the remnants of your birthday in the background there? You are. There's one <laughs> There's one balloon that still has helium in it, and the rest are kind of artfully drooped at this point. It's um, great. I know it's a li it looks a little bit sad, but it still feels <laughs> a little bit festive, so we're keeping them. <laughs> well, happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, this is super fun to talk to you today. I put my son on a bus at 5 o'clock this morning to Kennedy Space Center. He's nice. nine. It's his first trip there, and I'm super excited about it. That is really exciting, especially first trip. I didn't get out to Kennedy until I was in my 20s, or maybe uh, even 30s. It and it was awesome. It was one of those things where I just looked around, and I was just like, there's, I mean, being the history nerd that I am was just like, there's so much history. There's so many, there's so much history I want to touch. Like <laughs> you and me too. You know, I wanted to be an astronaut when I was little, I grew up in Houston. So okay. I spent a lot of time at Johnson, but I went to Kennedy uh, in an interesting environment where I was in training to be a diplomat oh, and wow. we used Kennedy as sort of a training center for our job and so I got to see some things I think that maybe most tourists don't get to see and I was totally geeking out the whole time it was hard to focus on my training <laughs> yeah that's really that's pretty fascinating yeah I feel yeah. like any public tour you do over there is going to be amazing but if you have an in and can get in one of my best experience actually I was um I was I've been I've, I've gotten the insider tour from a couple people just by luck a couple times but I was filming a documentary out there years ago and we were filming in the Apollo Saturn Center at like 7 30 in the morning and I think it opened at about nine at the time so while they were setting up the cameras and getting everything ready it was it was me the director the cameraman and then two people from NASA who were just kind of making sure you know we didn't wreck things because they have to <laughs> yeah. um it was literally five of us in this building and I had like half an hour while they were getting everything set up to wander around a Saturn V by myself. I got to see the Apollo 1 exhibit that had just opened alone and it was just like having a chance to actually just like sit with that stuff being someone who's like so steeped in the history of it and is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more a history person than a space person and to sit with that was was really incredible without you know people running around and stuff so it's a really it's a special place i hope you love yeah. it yeah <laughs> no it's amazing so i can't wait to ha to hear how his trip goes today and that's see what awesome. his impressions are yeah that's so yeah. great well let's talk about fighting for space i'm All so right. excited about this book and i appreciate you coming on to talk to us about it um you know i really loved the way that you constructed it, the way that you wove both Jackie Cochran's and Jerry Cobb's stories together with a, a healthy dose of Jackie at the front because she's so much older mm -hmm. than Jerry. Um, and also, especially like the ways that you set up the context for the relationships that Jackie had established that were going to become very critical and important in the, the later part of the book when we get into the question of whether women should go to space and, and all that. It was a, it was a, 
biography that read like a novel. I mean, it was gripping and sus oh, suspenseful, and I really enjoyed the way that you constructed it. Well, thanks. That was the goal the entire time. The more I dug into the story, the more I got to know both of these women, the more I wanted their story to kind of rope you in and make you feel involved and engaged with it the way you would reading a novel, not reading like a, and then this happened according to this source. Like, I hate those books. Like, I trust your research. Just tell me the story. So I really wanted to just let the story kind of unfold and bring you along with it. Well, you did it. It's a great narrative. Um, well, so for people who might not have had a chance to, mm -hmm. to, to read the book, can you introduce it for us? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's funny. I've been asked this so many times and it still feels like such a hard book to boil down to like a quick couple sentences, but yeah, I'm not surprised <laughs> <laughs> what it is in essence is a, is a dual biography of these two pilots, Jackie Cochran and Jerry Cobb. And they're both outstanding women, outstanding pilots in their own right. Uh, Jackie was actually the most decorated pilot of the 20th century bar none, not among women, among pilots, the first woman to break the sound barrier, first woman to fly a bomber overseas in the war. She led the Women's Air Force Service pilots in the war. She kind of, she was at the forefront and she was in this, this really incredible position to kind of be involved in basically everything, partially because she was an excellent pilot and partially because she was married to one of the 10 wealthiest men in the country, which afforded her certain access to things. Um, and she, she knew how to play the game. And I think that's what I like about Jackie she's deeply problematic. They both are, but she, she knew how to play the game. She knew she was the woman in the man's field and she leveraged that. And 25 years, her junior, so kind of comes into the story in the war, because that's where their stories make sense to intertwine, is Jerry Cobb, who came to, of age in a very different era of aviation. Jackie learned to fly in the, in the 30s when there were no women pilots, except for, you know, Amelia Earhart, who was a personal friend, because of course she was. Um, and Jerry was growing up during the war when women were flying, so it was much more accessible for her. She didn't grow up seeing these barriers. So as these two women are kind of coming of age, as their eras start to overlap, um, it coincides with America's entrance into space at, uh, in the wake of the Second World War and in the early Cold War, this idea of kind of supremacy in space being supremacy on a geopolitical scale of, you know, Cold War, we have to prove that our might is bigger than the other people's might and and that ended up being in space, which is still wild that that's a thing, that's, that's how that happened. Um, so the two of them kind of end up just by virtue of their position as pilots. And because NASA's original group of astronauts was selected from test pilots, they ended up being on the forefront of the discussion of whether or not women should and could even qualify to fly in space. And they end up going head to head over this issue in a really dramatic way. And it's, um, you know, it kind of ends with a whimper a little bit because there is no resolution, but it's really these two, these two women, their careers evolving beautifully and then hitting at this, this brick wall that neither of them can get past. Yeah, I, I'll be honest, that part of it is heartbreaking. And we'll talk about more of that, the, more about that later, you know, and the fact that it took 20 years for us to get a woman into space. Um, but there were some other really critical relationships in this book that play out. And so it, I would love to hear just a little bit about Jackie's relationships, especially with Dr. Lovelace, who initiated this exploration of women's capability to go into space, you know, mm -hmm. with all these physical tests, um, her husband, uh, Floyd Odlum, and then uh, her relationship with LBJ. Yeah, Jackie. Jackie is such a fascinating character, largely in part because of, I call her like the real Forrest Gump because she was just involved in so many people's lives. Um, everyone knows LBJ. And then there's this amazing story of Jackie just like saving his life one day and having to fly him. He, when he was running for, um, for Senate in 1940, was it 1949? Um, he had a bout of appendicitis that nearly killed him. And he was in Dallas um, for a campaign. Uh, this is right after the Air Force had become its stand a standalone service. And there was a, an Air Force luncheon and she was there because she'd helped do it. And LBJ needed to get to the hospital and they needed to kind of keep it secret because it would affect his campaign if, if people knew that he was sick. So she flew him overnight and she had this training as a nurse from back in her kind of before flying life. And while she's flying, he's vomiting. So she hands the controls over to her co-pilot and goes back, like strips him naked, gives him a shot of painkillers in the butt, and cleans him up and everything, puts him back into bed and delivers him to the hospital at the, in, in 
the Mayo Clinic. It was just like, or not the Mayo Clinic. Um, I forget where they landed. I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> but That's it was, okay. It's a, it's a compelling story. I was, I was like, what? Yeah. Did that happen? Yeah. It was one of those things where she just, she, like I said earlier, she kind of knew how to, to play the game. And she, she had these, you know, fortuitous meetings with these really interesting people. And one of them very early on was Dr. Randy Lovelace, who, who did the medical screening for NASA of the original Mercury astronauts and kind of ran that medical testing because he didn't work for NASA. He was very thorough and very discreet. And he had this clinic and was very interested in aviation medicine and had been since the late thirties, when he actually crossed paths with Jackie, he developed a, um, an oxygen tank that you could put over your nose and mouth to breathe at high altitude. Because of course, at, you know, above 10,000 feet, humans can't breathe. You need supplemental oxygen and planes in the thirties weren't pressurized. So pilots needed a mask and Jackie actually used his mask to win the 1938 Bendix air race. Um, she was the first solo woman to do it. And that kind of became a very fortuitous friendship. She s- successfully got Lovelace and his team, the Collier trophy that year, which came with funding. And she wanted it to get to the clinic that had trained him in Texas, where LBJ had just been elected to Congress. And that was the first meeting she could get was this young congressman. And the two of them were, you know, they both knew that powerful people are good friends. And they kind of hit it off in that sense. And that's how kind of she she gets LBJ, she gets Dr. Randy Lovelace in there. And then her, her meeting with Floyd, with her husband. I, I love that story because it just sounds like it's right out of an old movie. Um, she, she was a hairdresser before she learned to fly. She was just a hairdresser and she was working in New York and she, she would do winters in Miami at the sister salon. Cause you know, even during the depression, the early thirties, rich women still needed to look good. They weren't affected by, by anything that was going on. So that allowed her to not be affected too much by the depression. And she ended up at a fancy party one night, say next to this kind of soft-spoken, mild-mannered guy who turned out to be exceedingly wealthy. <laughs> um, whether or not she says she didn't know who he was, it's very possible she manipulated her way into sitting next to him. That's speculation. <laughs> There's no record of that. But at any rate, they hit it off. And and she told him that he she wanted to create her own cosmetics line. And, and he said, well, if you're going to do that, you have to learn to fly because you, you need to cover more ground than you can in a car. So that's what planted the seed. And this kind of became this, this epic life for her flying and this epic romance. And they were, were, you know, inseparable and had a really interesting, they worked together, but they were also very, very much a couple. There's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's I have so pictures of them matching clothes in the sixties. It's just really cute. <laughs> oh my God. That's adorable. Yeah. When she, when she ran for Congress in 1956 and didn't make it, um, they did a lot of publicity around them as like the first couple of California and stuff. And it was was super contrived like it is in politics, but they're in these little like matching ranch outfits. (laughs) Great. That's awesome. (laughs) So there have been several books written on this period of history and these women. Um, Why did you want to write this book and what makes yours different? I wanted to write this book because the, the other titles that deal with these women never sat well with me. There's always the narrative, the, the women that did the, the medical testing that took on NASA, they're called usually the Mercury 13, which is a play on the Mercury 7, which was of course the first group of male astronauts. And the Mercury 13 wasn't a real thing. Like it was a, it was a term that a Hollywood producer came up with for a Dateline state uh, segment in 1995. So like they were not a group. Um, the idea that they were taking on NASA and NASA just wanted them out was because they were women is not true. Um, So every time the story is told, it's told as this like epic story of sexism keeping women down. And it's so much more complicated than that. It's so much more nuanced than that. And I think it actually does all of the women involved a huge disservice to say like, they were great, but NASA was sexist. So boo, and they did nothing wrong. Like they're, they're people, people make mistakes. People go about things the wrong way. And there were a lot of things about the way the story is usually told that is just it also just didn't work with everything I know about NASA at the time. And I've, I've done a lot of work on NASA's early age, especially kind of the pre-Mercury and Gemini days. And none of it made sense. So when I started looking into the story, I wanted to tell it in a way that actually put the women's story against the men's story. So you can see that it was, it's not just NASA being sexist. It's a much deeper issue of women's access to things um, that, you know, in NASA in deciding to pick the first group of astronauts from test pilots, the women weren't test pilots. I mean, right off the bat, it wasn't that NASA was deselecting women by saying test pilots. NASA was deselecting 99.9% of 
humanity. So, you know, to, to put it in simplistic terms, I think does it a disservice. And I really wanted to dig in. And then when I was researching it, and I started reading about Jackie and I realized how connected she was to all of the major players being the, the big NASA people to LBJ, who by this time is vice president. Um, you start to see that she's really integral to this story. And it's more a story of how these women are trying to break into this man's world and the different ways that they were and were not successful. And that shows how much it's, it's really at the end of the day, a very human story. Like I said, people, go about things wrong. They, they are not qualified because of many things. And these women are just human people. They are flawed. They, they weren't in the right position at the right time. It's, it's a much more nuanced story. And I, I wanted to tell it right. I wanted to get it right. Well, I won't you name, are... sorry, I, I will okay. add one thing. <laughs> um, I, I won't name, I won't name any, any titles, but I, I also know um, a friend of mine has worked with a lot of these women for years, starting in the 90s. So some of them who've since passed, I, I wasn't obviously able to interview, but he did in the 90s. And I have I have emails that they sent him um, in years since since they worked together saying that, like, some of these books got their stories wrong and that they were mad about it. So that was another motivation for me was to actually go back to the source material that I could find, which was thousands of pages of letters that they wrote and actually use their own words. Because other, other stories that have been told about this get it wrong from the women themselves who were there. They say that they don't like the way they were portrayed in other works and articles and books and stuff. And I really wanted to let their own words speak for themselves. Well, that's fascinating. And I can see the places in which in the book where you were making a point to do that and show uh, you know a more balanced presentation of the varied uh, opinions about what was going on from the various women. And, you know, you, you bring up like your fascination with space and your fascination with history. I, you know, I want to know like, what, what brought you to this? What, tell me about your background and, <laughs> and what got you so involved in this topic? Yeah. I mean, my, my kind of fascination with space and more the history of space than anything is, um, when I was seven, I first read about the moon landing. I'm from Canada, so it's not something that's kind of in our pop culture the same way it is in the United States. And um, I just saw a little cartoon in a book that I still have on my shelf um, of a little cartoon astronauts, two of them standing by a lunar module. And I just thought people went to the moon. Like, why was I not informed? And I, I wanted to understand not how, I mean, how obviously, but more why. Like, why would you do that? Because I still have the same question. People are talking about like Orion going back to the moon. Like, why are we doing that? There isn't actually a need, right? We don't have a need to go to the moon. We didn't have a need to go to the moon, except that we did because of the Cold War. So I feel like what's so, as I got older and learned more about it, I became fascinated with the fact that, you know, people look at space as this thing that's like, it's for humanity. It's beautiful. It's the exploration for all mankind. Like, no, no, no it's politics. Stop saying that it's anything but politics. Don't say that the, the moon landings is anything but a giant, pardon my language, a giant pissing contest. Like, let's be, let's be real here. It was a giant Absolutely. pissing contest. Yep. And to, to kind of take it into this idealistic light does it a huge disservice. So I've, I've really enjoyed getting into the, the weeds on like the technology that developed and why the, the political landscape was this perfect storm of technology being at the right place, post-war excess and post-war funding being at a really good rate, but also the need to do something completely insane, like send humans to the moon, how it worked. Like that's fascinating to me. So the more I kind of get into the, the layers of this era, the, the mid-century fascinates me to no end because it's like this era where it's, it's national brainstorming and there are no bad ideas in brainstorming, except that of course there are. <laughs> You know, the CIA, NASA, like everyone's brainstorming insane things because of the Soviet, the Cold War and the Soviet Union. And all of this stuff is coming. It's just wild. So the more I got into it, the more I loved exploring all of the facets. And, and um, this is a story that people kept bringing up to me because I am a young woman in a field that's very male dominated. And people always ask me about these women. And I read a couple books and it never, it, like I said, it never really sat well with me. And I really wanted to understand it from a, from the woman's perspective and kind of from the women's angle a little bit more so that I could, could dig in and, and look at a different facet of it. And that's kind of where my desire to really dive into the story and, and do it from an historical standpoint, not a feminist standpoint. Cause it, you know, 
I mean, this is like a whole other topic, but like feminism meant something different in the early 60s than it does now. And we can't look at it from a modern lens. We have to look at it within the confines of its era. So it ends up being an interesting thing. Well, it does. And I will confess that I struggled with that a lot. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I, I, because I see these women as heroic, both Mm -hmm. Jackie in all her flaws and Mm -hmm. Jerry in all her flaws. I find them to be heroic and all of the women in the wasp and everyone who's fought every fight for women to be able to do anything, um, particularly in aviation, because that's my, that's my jam. Um, And we're still, you know, we're still like five to 7% of pilots in aviation. And so it's just like, I've been fighting this fight for, you know, my whole career. So yeah, uh, it was really hard to, to, to absorb. I mean, there's, there's, an acknowledgement of the times for sure. But then, you know, we always put our lens on it from where we are now. And it's so mm-hmm. frustrating to watch this um, yeah. the shifting, you mm-hmm. know, landscapes that were happening at the time. Yeah. And it, I was quite stunned. That was something that I really did want to um, get across in this book at how little has really changed for women in male dominated fields. I mean, it's, there are there it's people people like to say I mean women have made strides that's for sure but like it's not it's not nearly as equal as people want to say it is you know I feel like and this is one thing that since we're just kind of discussing women and astronauts that drives me a little bit crazy is when NASA's now it's verbiage about going back to the moon is next man and first woman like could you use verbiage that makes it sound more like you're putting the woman there just for tokenism like yeah, how about can the you next not just American say the next crew? Yeah, yeah, the next crew. Yeah, the Thank next you. crew on the moon is Steve, Sally, Jim, and Pam. Like, just just let them all be people instead of trying to like by by trying to draw attention to the equal like the equalization among genders is actually I think artificially driving more of a divide because to me if if you if I was that woman and I was the first woman on the moon I'd be like why is my womanness what's defining me why is it not the fact that I am a pilot an astronaut a scientist or whatever whatever my expertise is why am I still being defined as woman and then something else if that's not how I see myself Oh and I gosh. feel like that's the endless fight. And that's just, it's a very hard thing to convey to people who don't experience it, which is half the world. <laughs> and know, it's, and I, every woman has a different experience of it too, which makes it that much harder to kind of convey. I have to mention this book that I am not finished reading, I will confess, but I started reading. And I don't have the author's name at my fingertips, but because you brought all this up, she brings this this up about how we gender things this way and how it harms our cause and it is called x plus y a mathematician's manifesto on something gender and it is excellent and it it, interesting does lots of things about talking about i think you would find it fascinating i think Mm -hmm. anybody who has questions about the way that we use statistics to talk about gender and gender differences and those kinds of things she does she makes a very strong case for the ways in which you know there is really a very we're not outside the standard deviation on most things and so mm-hmm. um it's really fascinating anyway interesting that. yeah it's a really good it, it's a really interesting study I, but it is fairly academic so i haven't finished it yet yeah fair <laughs> Um, oh, okay. So, you know, you get into, um, well, you basically present the story about Jerry randomly being on the beach and running into Dr. Loveless. Like this is like a random meeting where he's like, oh, hey, come on down and I'll test you for the astronaut thing and see how you do. And she's like, okay. And then she does it and she does well. Yeah. So do you, and then she continues to have other opportunities for further testing. She also creates opportunities for psychological testing Mm -hmm. on her own, independent of this sort of bubble that they're working in. Based on all that, um, do you think that her expectations were appropriate based on her experience in the moment? Do you think that she had the right to feel like she had an opportunity in space? I think, 
I think, and here's, here's where I feel like I just got to say up front. Um, she wrote Jerry, both Jerry and Jackie wrote two memoirs and that's kind of where I got the bulk of their story and tried to fill it out with as many other primary sources I could find. And I know we'll probably talk about that in a little bit, but um, it's really hard because Jerry's version is, is almost too idealized to be real. And there's questions of whether or not, you know, that's how that happened. But regardless of like whether she was invited or whether she sought out the opportunity to test at the Lovelace Center, um, you know, she did and she did, you can't really pass a medical test. So she did well. Um, I think she believed that she had a better chance than she really did. I think she she felt that because she'd done well and that because she had, succeeded as a pilot you know she was she was a, a career pilot already before she was 20 you know she was really making it work for herself and I think that because she'd been able to kind of find these opportunities put herself out there really get get what she wanted from a job that this was kind of the next logical progression for her so I think that that what she was experiencing and the way she was kind of going going about it I think she believed she had a much better chance at actually getting into space than she really did I think there were factors at play that she either wasn't fully aware of or failed to totally consider the ramifications of that meant that she wasn't nearly as close to her goal as she thought she was. And, you know, she wasn't the only one obviously wrapped up in this. There were these other women who yeah. successfully completed these physical tests. And I can see how in their isolation, they would have very little understanding of what exactly was going on or yeah. what to expect. And then all of these letters, oh my goodness, oh my God, all the of letters. this jockeying for position power, both between yeah. Jerry and Jackie, was incredible and very illuminating. Oh my goodness. Um, but I can yeah. see, like, if I were on the receiving end of those, I would be like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. uh, who's in charge? Mm -hmm. What exactly is going on? I thought I just did, like, a physical test, and now, you know, I'm going to be going to the moon next. Like, what? Yeah. Like, talk about that a little it's, bit. It's, um, and I'll tell you, when I found the, this, this folder, this massive folder of letters in the archives, I, I yelled in this quiet reading room at the Eisenhower Library. She's like, oh, and I looked around, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and like kept photographing everything, fantastic. Um, because I, like I said, I wanted the women to speak for themselves and that allowed me to let them have their own words. But um, yeah, it was a mess. It like, to put it bluntly, that program was a hot mess of not even really being a program. So what, you know, Jerry took some tests and Dr. Lovelace really wanted to understand, you know, was she exceptional? Were women just good? Cause there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of testing about the physicality and, and the mental fortitude of female pilots like there was for men. So, you know, for him, it was a medical curiosity. He was kind of excited about the idea of kind of pushing them forward. Jerry thought that because they had, she had, you know, the NASA physician who was not a NASA physician on her side, that it was going to mean something. So, but then Randy Lovelace is this, you know, old friend of Jackie's. They were very close. The, the Lovelaces and the Cochran, Co Cochran Odlum clan, they were very close. Uh, Randy Lovelace's daughter was actually named Jackie. So, you know, that's the closeness of the families. Um, so, you know, he was also consulting Jackie because she was the most experienced female pilot in the country and a great resource for him. So you end up with this really weird situation where the women were never never all together as a group. These 13 women that did the medical test, they never all met. By the time they met in the 90s, a couple of them had already passed. They never got together as a group. They didn't have this this like, you know, sisterhood of the divine traveling space pants or whatever that movie is they they were really going you know one here they got a letter from this person they got another letter from this person they you know two of them cross paths they changed notes but they didn't all get the same information i i had got emails from a couple of women and, and did speak to one one of the women and she said you know if you if you were there when um when randy lovelace was there you felt like it was a real program but if you were there when he wasn't there you felt like you were just doing a physical so the information and the experiences they were getting differed from woman to woman and then as they wrote each other letters as they got letters from jackie jerry and randy it all became this this mess of not being on the same page and it ended up being that the women kind of you know some of them didn't want to give up what was at the time a very rare and a very lucky career as a professional pilot. 
to take a chance on something that was not a sure thing being space flight. They wanted, they didn't want to leave their jobs to do this testing. Some of them were willing to give it up completely for a shot just to see. So they couldn't even get all on the same page in what they wanted to see happen next. And it became this really, really messy thing where there, there was no unity. There was no group goal. And um, as Jerry kind of pushed her issue into the public, you know, she was profiled in, in newspapers. She took her all the way to, to a congressional subcommittee hearing. A lot of the women did, weren't happy with her as their, her, the self-appointed spokesperson. They, they were upset that she was speaking for them without their, their permission and their consent. So it, there were, were fractures within this group that were being presented to the public and have been presented to the public as this unified group. And they weren't at all. Yeah, that part of it was fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we celebrated Wally Funk's trip to space last mm -hmm. year, which was fabulous. Yeah. Did you have a chance to talk to her at all? She, um, I, so I have a, a friend, we have a mutual friend and he got in touch with her. She said she was happy to talk to me. And then she, she'd spoken to another journalist about something and didn't like the way she was portrayed. I don't know if it was a book or an article. And um, she decided she didn't feel comfortable speaking to the press anymore, even though I told her I'm not pressed that I want to get her story right. And I, you know, so I, she wouldn't, she wouldn't speak to me, unfortunately, but um, I did have all the correspondence that she had with my friend of kind of replaying her story. You know, this is going back to the nineties that she kind of told him everything in her own words. She had all of her, you know, her schedule from her time at the clinic. She had this packet of information stuff that he, she'd given him. So I, I was able to use that as well. Um, so I, I, Got, got her words secondhand, unfortunately. But yeah, well, I wasn't able to speak with her. That's really fascinating. And I, well, I will just say that all of us in, in aviation and space and who anyone who knows her story and knows this story, we were just like crying. <laughs> it's a, and, she, and she's see, she's a great story. And she's, you know, where some of the women didn't want to give anything up because they want they didn't want to risk their careers to the shot. Wally's on the other side. She's like, now, take me now. I mean, she applied for the astronaut corps three times or two times mm -hmm. after that she she would say that that was her first application she applied twice and she never got it because as the requirements were evolving she was always a little bit behind um which is which has nothing to say of how accomplished she is i mean she has a fascinating career um but it it kind of goes to show you that it, it doesn't matter if you you know you can be fantastic but just be shy of this one thing that this highly specified group needs and it, it says nothing about how great you are so yeah. um yeah. but I, I i i wish i'd had a chance to talk to her i i i do have her phone number and i called her and i left a couple voicemails and her voicemail was like let's go flying it was just really sweet it was just like, Aw. <laughs> that's lovely she, yeah she's just a, so. a heroine have you, have you spoken to her i haven't okay. um i would like to but uh i haven't yet yeah I, but I'm, you know, there are certain people that I'm starstruck by. I got past yep. that hump with one of them recently and I got to fly with her. And so maybe I'll get past nice. it with Wally at some nice. point. <laughs> um, nice. So you, so you in, I think it's in your author's note or whatever you did. And you mentioned it here that you are presenting the material as presented from the perspectives of the protagonists. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. One might be called an antagonist. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, I don't... We'll just, we will just call them both protagonists. Well, yeah, because be... I what I think is really funny is how many people I talk to and people are clearly either Team Jackie or Team Jerry. And I don't and I didn't really intend for that to happen. But I think people either feel that they're more of like a Jerry archetype, like going for everything or the Jackie archetype of like, I'm going to play the game. Like, I, I feel like people kind of pick their person a little bit. So I, I wanted them to they're both they're both great and they're both like fraught with issues on you know challenging in their in yeah they, I get it. <laughs> as are all humans I'm as are sure. humans but Jackie's pretty special because she yeah. is very polarizing I will say mm -hmm. that in my mm -hmm. I mean there are people who are like fanatically yeah. pro Jackie and people yeah. who fanatically are like she ruined everything yeah. and I'm like somewhere in the middle and can kind of see both sides yeah. but so yeah, so the the research that you did and the way that you incorporated it into the narrative was from the perspectives of the information that these ladies shared. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like you had access to more information yeah. than might have shown up in the book. And so um, there's this interesting rumor 
that Jackie might have um, mm-hmm. participated in the Loveless tests herself and perhaps yeah. was not, uh, you know, deemed yep. a potential candidate and therefore she was even more motivated to maybe influence the yeah. program not going forward. Yeah. So what do you what do you have to say about that? Um, so I've heard that, and okay. um, I think the and I'm not I'm not even gonna lie I can't remember if I mentioned that I I knew that in the author's note. <laughs> I don't, I don't think so. There. I don't um, think okay. so. Yeah. Um, so I have heard that rumor, and the problem is I couldn't find a credible source beyond people speculating about it. So I didn't want to bring it into the main narrative of the book. But um, I, what I did try to bring it, I did try to bring that, that in because at the time that all this was happening, she was over 50, which put her out of the age range for anybody going into space. So yeah, I, 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 tr- I, I tried to bring that in without saying like, there's also this rumor because I, I don't want to editorialize in, in the narrative, but she was over 50. She was not, she had no chance. She also had, um, she had a botched appendicitis when she was a kid. So she had this, uh, they effectively left talc in her abdomen, which creates little, what she called barnacles. So she had intestinal adhesions. Uh, I actually have the same thing from a car accident when I was a kid. So I, I feel a bond with her for that. And oh. um, I know that like that basically, I mean, I also wanted to be an astronaut as a kid. Not only am I too short and not good enough at math, but I also would never be medically fit to fly because I have this abdominal issue that can strike on a moment's notice and you never know. So she would have also been medically unfit. So there was no way she was ever going up. So I tried to to kind of bring in this idea of her really wanting to turn the women's space program into like the wasps of space so that if she couldn't be the one going she was the decider right. and she ultimately really butt heads with jerry and i think jerry just pissed her off just enough to where she really just was like look i'm not even against women going up into space i just don't want you to go because now i hate you that there is this like this really strong antagonism between the two of them at the time and um yeah, I, I tried to kind of make that clear that that was a part of what was happening too, without drawing it, without saying it expressly, because I I could not find any anything that said for certain she took the test and she failed. So that was that was a bit of a challenge as as the writer trying to you know not wanting to introduce something spe- super speculative in, so using what I had to to kind of show that to the reader indirectly. Are all of the Loveless tests like public record? Can you go and look? I at couldn't them? find any of them. Oh, medical records are sealed. That's that's one thing. You know, medical records. Even I mean, I even spoke to. I've met uh, D. O'Hara, who is the astronaut's nurse in the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs, and I talked. I've met her at, at a couple of, of events, and I talked to her, and she said, "I could, you know, I could tell you stories about them as people, but." medical records are sealed. I can never discuss any of their issues. You know, the stuff that's that's public is stuff that they have written, like Deke, Deke Slayton having Meniere's disease. I mean, that's that's publicly known, but there's a lot of things that will never be out there. So the Lovelace Foundation, so Randy Lovelace died in 1965 in a plane crash. So the Lovelace Foundation, as, he, as it was in his day and in this era, no longer exists. That's the other thing too. So I tried to get in touch with the current Lovelace Foundation or the Lovelace Clinic. And it was, it was, I could not find anyone who could give me any kind of record from the era. So that's the other thing where, you know, there are bits and pieces that people maybe have in their own personal archives, but there is not a, a, it's not publicly available. Medical stuff is, is never going to be totally open. Yeah, no. And that makes sense. And as as it should be, I mean, I guess so. Yep. Um, so you did allude to the fact that you didn't want to editorialize about that portion of Jackie's potential story, but there are places, and I and I have to pull this out because um, there were places that I, as a reader, sensed that there was some editorial going on um, to really drive home uh, some of ja- Jerry's behavior following yeah. the trials where you're like, you know, she's really struggling. She's really grasping at straws here. She's really kind of like, you yeah. know, maneuvering. And I was like, yeah, she is. But for the past 300 pages, Jackie yeah. has been doing this all doing along and worse thing. and you haven't said anything about it. So yeah, so I think, cause I think, <laughs> well, I think what in, in both cases, you know, again, like I, I was using what I had to point to and you could see, 
I think I, I tried to get it across that Jackie, you know, manipulated people as much as she needed to, you know, when she was flying the bomber overseas in the war, you know, putting in that like Floyd was friends with, you know, Lord Beaverton or whatever his name was to, to get her to fast track her into the Royal Canadian Air Force to fly that bomber overseas because America wasn't technically in the war yet. That like, that's clearly her manipulating her position to get what she wants. And I think it just, it was less out of desperation and more out of want, like wantingness that it, it Cal- maybe came calculation. Across. Yeah, More yeah, she was, I, yeah, I tried to get across how calculated she was. I mean, she she friggin used her husband to get into a jet to break the sound barrier because she was fighting with Jacqueline Oriol in France about speed records. I mean, I tried to, to make it very clear that Jackie's abusing her positions left, right and center. And, you know, she she I think I think what kind of softens it a little bit for Jackie is that she you know, she wanted to be the fastest woman on the planet and she, she did it and she knew that she could do it with, with Jerry. I think, especially after that trial, I think, and this, and a lot, you know, I will say that a lot of this is influenced by a friend of mine who was one of my readers who was, I was working closely and who, who knew Jerry, um, who we were trying to figure out. And I was bouncing off him a lot of the right way to get across her kind of I don't know. It's almost like this. It's not quite a fall. It's just like she was so desperate to get this to work and it didn't work. So she just left the country like this. This put her into such a deep spiral of depression for a while that I kind of wanted to show you how much she was like using every last chance she had to try to do this. And that when it didn't work, it was that devastating to her. That's kind of what I was trying to get across. Whereas, you know, Jackie being calculated is just as manipulative. And she got the thing she wanted and then she moved on because she did it. And she has that very much like, a, I did this, I did this, I did this air. And Jerry was so focused on this one thing that pulling out these, these articles, writing this memoir in the wake of it, you know, that came out the same month as Tereshkova, um, that Tereshkova flew in space, that it's really kind of, it was m- m- so much more emotionally driven for her, that it was this, it was this absolute passion to see this one thing through that when it didn't work it became so all-consuming and so completely devastating that she had to separate herself entirely that it it meant that much more to her yeah you you say it. i i hear you and on all those points but i also um you know uh jerry going overseas and doing the missionary work that she did um felt like a natural step yeah. based on the narrative that you presented. I yeah. mean, it's it, she, you know, she had done all this fairy flying. She had flown overseas already yeah. and she had this interest from before. So I, I am yeah. happy for her if that was a way to kind of heal from this whole experience and move on. And I, and I think it was, and I think it was, I think, I think it still shows how, how much, how much losing that one that one thing meant to her and how much she had put into a new, you know, um, there's a, there's a difference in, in Jackie writing a few letters to someone to get what she wants and Jerry having to fight for years to not get what she wants. And that's why, you know, when I, I knew that she ended up in South America, I knew that she ended up doing this missionary work. So I wanted to kind of build in her, her closeness with South America earlier on. So that when she kind of came back to it, it was almost like that comfort of going back to a familiar place where she felt reconnected to herself and I wanted to give her that and that's something that I don't think Jackie ever had I don't think Jackie ever had a connection to something there's a lot more and that's kind of why I I put in her losing her child early on because she she lost her connections very early in life and she had to kind of be this strong independent woman that I think broke down a lot and I think every time she didn't get what she wanted it actually hit her much more hard like much more firmly than she would acknowledge. I think she was too proud to admit that these things were hard for her. Whereas Jerry kind of accepted the pain and moved on. Oh, that's a really interesting point. I think, yeah. yeah. I you think know, there's, there's yeah. a, something a little cold and removed from Jackie, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and yeah, Jerry seems to have a more resonating emotional center for sure. Yeah. And I think um, that's why people gravitate to Jerry because she has that connection. She has that emotional yeah. side to her. Whereas Jackie, you know, she didn't totally sever ties with family. She did actually have some connection, but she hid it. 
she hid it from the world. She didn't want to acknowledge where she came from and that that makes her a very distant person. And when you see how calculating she is, she becomes somebody that that I've, I've spoken, spoken to a lot of readers who don't like her because she doesn't feel like a person with warmth. Yeah. And I get yeah. that. Yeah. And when you were establishing this um, sort of history and relationship with South America with Jerry, you include this romance. I couldn't not. Between <laughs> her and, and I was like, I was swooning. I was I like, know, right? oh, this is the most romantic thing I've ever read. And then in, spoiler alert, in yeah. the author's note, you know, reveal that he's like, married like yeah I and actually um do you have the pay you do have the paperback okay because I yes. found a couple of mentions of his of Jack Ford's wife after the hardcover came out so when my my editor talked to me about you know any additions any little things you need to do for the paperback oh is that the updated that's with new the research? updated new research because <laughs> Mary Ford is not mentioned in the original because I couldn't I had this I heard, heard rumors that he was married, but I couldn't find anything specific. And then what I found was publicity shots of Jack and Mary Ford with, I forget who played them in this fictionalized movie about them, but publicity shots of them. And I was like, okay. And then I found the picture of Jackie at Mary Ford's first wedding. And I was like, this is so weird. So I had to get Mary Ford just to layer her in a little bit. So that's the new research because we were trying not to affect the pagination too much. Um, but um, I was wondering what that was. Yeah, we had a couple of readers yeah. who were like, what's the new research? Exactly? Yeah, no, it's it's literally, it's very, very tiny things. We, we couldn't do like a, you know, a big overhaul. We And it, we figured, we talked about, you know, redoing the author note to bring it in but it didn't seem like enough to merit redoing it so we we were really trying to not to mention it was in covid and you know things were kind of a mess so so maybe it wasn't as yeah anyways but um she has yet yeah, jerry tells this story in in her memoir of this like epic romance with her boss and he's this dashingly handsome man flying out of la well burbank but out of la dating movie stars and you know, she feels like she's just kind of the kid like flying along and, and realizes that like she kind of likes him a little bit, but is way too shy. And then, you know, she has this this issue. She's in a single prop plane over the ocean and she oh, I forget what exactly happens, but it's like a, a fuel. It's her prop seal. Her prop, prop seal, seal breaks. And then the, and then her. I, I haven't her read the book in a while. Is, well, that's <laughs> okay. I'm a pilot. So, yeah, yeah no, her prop. It, you, you, yeah. It's a, yeah, so she's got like oil all oil over her windscreen. She can't it's see. seeping into the cockpit. She can't see. He's on the radio and she's like, it's fine. I'll ditch. I'm a swimmer. And he's like, I'm not letting you go down. I'm staying with you. I can't lose a pilot now. And then pause. And also, I love you. And it's just this, you're like, it's right. I mean, that's why it's <laughs> the, whole, the whole thing, again, is cited out of her memoirs because who knows? It's, it's, we only have her word because Jack Ford died in 1959. So he couldn't write anything about her. Um, but it's this epic thing where, you know, they get out of the plane, they survive. He guides her down by radio onto the runway. And, you know, he gets out, she's all oily and he picks her up and, and hugs her and kisses her. And it's just this like, we'll come back here, my love. And they, they start this epic romance where they're, you know, they're ferrying and, and they'll meet up in London. They'll have a golf date in Paris, all of these things. And at the same time, you know, he is meeting her family and, and this, this thing and, it felt weird to me when I read it that it was just this thing that she never talks about another romance. In both of her memoirs, she never talks about another. She has no children. Um, she, you know, there was nothing else in her life that she ever discussed quite like Jack Ford. Um, so then when I found out that Jack Ford was actually married and that there was this movie that was made about him and his wife and this fairy thing. And in this movie, there's a younger girl that he has an affair with. It sort of solidified that it was, there's pictures of them that I couldn't, um, I couldn't license for the book because they came in, in Jerry's, uh, in Jerry's memoirs. I couldn't get a hold of her or her estate or anyone connected. Um, and wow. then she passed while I was writing. So there was, you know, I have no way of getting a proper version of it, but there's pictures of them in the surf holding hands. It was real. It's just unclear how real it was, whether it was more real for her, you know, for him, you know, he was in his mid thirties. It might've just been like a fun little fling for her at, you know, 22, that that's important when you're that young. So it, you know, I wanted to include it because I wanted to have her have that kind of coming of age romance that really kind of fleshes her out as not just a pilot, but as a, as a woman with emotions too. And I loved bringing that side of her out just a little bit. It was incredible. Yeah, I was so it was like sucked nuts. in. I was yeah. like, "This is the best. This is the most romantic story I've ever no. read." <laughs> I know. It's like reading it. I was just like, "Oh, how did this I happen know. to you?" I loved it. I did. I loved I it. Know. <laughs>
Okay. Um, these ladies, you know, mm. I mentioned at the beginning of this that it was 20 years before we actually put a woman in space. So what legacy do you think that they left? Not just Jackie, not just yeah. Jerry, but all of the ladies who were tested for the program. I think that's, that's the really hard question because I think we kind of got to start answering that with would, would anything have changed had they flown in space? Because at the end of the day, you know, Jerry, Jerry wanted to be fast tracked into the program to fly. And if she had flown, you know, the Mercury spacecraft were basically automated. They had very little control. It couldn't do any orbital maneuver, uh, maneuverings at all. Um, would she have been anything more significant than a publicity display? Because that's what Valentina Tereshkova was. Valentina Tereshkova had no control over her spacecraft. She yep. flew with, I forget who was the pilot of Vostok 5, um, but she flew with another cosmonaut, but they were in separate spacecraft and they flew but close to each other. To be fair, all of these hot test pilots who were qualified for the program were then same capsules with no controls yeah. as well. Oh no, oh, absolutely. <laughs> so. I, no, absolutely. I that's I actually have a Gemini. This is a Gemini Regala wing tattoo. Like for me, the Gemini program is where it gets really cool because they started doing stuff. Um, so I think, you know, but yeah, they they couldn't, they didn't, they didn't do stuff. They were, they were the publicity is what made them famous more than, you know, they were brave. They got on top of missiles. Like that's, that's badass. Not to say that it wouldn't be badass for her to also get on top of a missile and shoot into space. But you know, it's, she wasn't going to, women probably weren't going to be on Apollo missions, not only because they're, you know, there, there are straight up issues of like, would a woman be comfortable pooping in a bag in a tiny spacecraft in front of two guys? I mean, I mean, frankly, like, would I? I don't know. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, there are certain things where they couldn't even figure out how to get a urine well, collection system. Listen, right I have stage fright, so like, I, that's a whole different story. But anyway. so, you know, like, there are there are certain things where where when you look at what NASA was doing at the time and how getting to the moon by the end of the decade, cause like, you know, the, the, the important kind of time thing to look at here is that the hearing where the women, it kind of decided that the women weren't gonna be fast tracking to space happened well, something like two weeks after, I'm trying to remember my date. No, it was less than, it was a year after um, Kennedy said, we'll go to the moon by the end of the decade. And a week after NASA had selected the way of going to the moon. So like, when you look at it within the context, what's gonna be more important? Woman in space, so victory over the Soviet Union. Like, of course you understand why they weren't gonna be selected. And because NASA was, you know, already knew how to deal with these guys, knew how to deal with military pilots who could take orders, who could do these things, who could pee in a tube, they probably weren't going to introduce something that was going to drastically change things at the time. You made Whether, that point so well, but why 20 years? Why did it why take two whole decades? Years? So, so, and I think it's worth pointing out here that, you know, Tereshkova went up and she was very much a publicity stunt because the, the Russians saw what, what, you know, Jerry was getting for press and said, well, we got to beat them to it. So they sent her up 20 years because NASA changed what it needed from an astronaut. NASA's astronaut requirements didn't really change until the 70s, at which point it opened up, to, you know, the, there were two, there, were, there was one kind of astronaut. It was a military test pilot because they could react really fast. They were used to being an engineer's eyes and ears in the cockpit. In the 70s, NASA opened it up to military test pilots and mission specialists, which opened it up to doctors, which opened it up to scientists, which opened it up to people, which already in the country included a lot of women. At the time, women couldn't train as military test pilots. So women couldn't get into that group. But there is, so there is something interesting. And I, again, I've talked about this, but I couldn't find any firm details. So I couldn't put it in. And even as the authors know, NASA's group four was the scientist astronauts. This is where Jack Schmidt, who was the last man on the moon, was selected. He's a geologist. Um, NASA works closely with the National Science Foundation for this group, and there were actually four women on the long list. And this was in 1966. There were four women that were on the long list to maybe go, to maybe join the astronaut corps. And I, I haven't been able to find any record of why they were deselected, but you know, there was 40 on this list. And five got selected. So it might've straight up been that they needed certain qualifications, but 
there's also, I mean, I'm, I'm curious whether or not the negative publicity that had ultimately come with the fight for these women to gain a spot in space hadn't just made NASA say, let us just do this thing for the Cold War and then we'll start figuring out the rest of the stuff. If, if it hadn't been, you know, that wasn't a part of it. I, I don't know. That's purely my speculation. But there were women who were starting to qualify, but it was really when NASA opened the qualifications up and started flying shuttle missions that it was open, started being open to, you know, not just the same military test pilots. And of course, you know, 19 years after Tereshkova, it was Svetlana Savitskaya because NASA was like, Sally Ride's going up. And the Soviets are like, nope, not before us. <laughs> of course. That happened, and, yeah. And then we have, and then we have uh, Dr. Eileen Collins mm -hmm. who gets to go up, what, I think she was 1993. 90, 95, I think it was 95 and 99. 1995 when she went up first time and then she yeah. was in command the first in first commander, yeah, the first. And that was um, a friend of mine, um, this is the friend that I've been alluding to this whole time who worked closely with these women. He actually was at that launch with Jerry. And he said that it was um, wow, just an amazing thing to see. Like, you know, if, I've, I've never been to a launch, but you know, it was this huge, big launch. There was this like big wasp reunion, you know, all these women pilots. It was this Eileen Collins really made it clear that like she wanted to celebrate all of the women who'd come before her, who helped pave the way, who opened, you know, military test schools to women and all this stuff. Um, and the launch was scrubbed twice. And as the launches are scrubbed, you know, people can't stay. The crowds get smaller and smaller. But Jerry was there. Jerry was like not, there was no way she was missing this. And he told me the story that she, um, when at the launch site, there's a fence that's like the limit of where you can go in the viewing area. And she walked right up against it so that she could be as close as possible. And he said, just like feel the vibration of it launching because she just wanted to be there so badly. And that um, he has this, this memory of her of when they were going on the, the public bus back from the launch area to the parking lot, because you can't drive onto Kennedy, right? That she just sat there and she was just looked, he described it as she just had a beatific smile on her face. Like she finally kind of saw the realization of her dream that much later. Um, and I love that moment. I really loved that. And I wish I'd, I'd been able to get hold of her and, and gotten that story from her, but it was a hard one to kind of bring in. I hand, love but that it's, it's a great moment. I love the pictures of those ladies who were there yeah. for that. They just are so inspiring. Wally yeah. Funk was there. Yeah. Um, and I'm super excited because uh, I will be at Women in Aviation International next week, which nice. is our annual conference. And um, Dr. Collins will be there uh, awesome. with her book, to, uh, Through the Gas, Through the Glass Ceiling to nice. the Stars. And I'm excited to have the chance to meet her and maybe get that's her to awesome. sign a book so that's yeah super fun. i met her at an event a few years ago and you know I, I always feel like when i talk to these people i'm like i have so many things to talk to you about and then i get there i'm just like hi <laughs> but um i did i just like i got i just get so tongue-tied and of course i'm standing there and i'm talking to her just chatting a little bit about her her stuff and there's other people milling around because it's eileen collins and then mike collins comes up and they're like hey where are the collinses and i'm like well now and now I'm just watching this happen. <laughs> so I do have a signed picture of her on the on my wall, which That's is one of my so one of my great. favorites. So yeah, That's that was amazing so to meet her. Yeah, and um, I don't know if you like you probably don't have access to the ninety nines, but the ninety nines, which is you yeah. know the the Women's Pilots Association, had a celebration of the whatever anniversary it was last year mm -hmm. of these ladies and. Yeah. Um, and they were on and it was it was fantastic nice. so nice you know you have other things going on and I, <laughs> first of all let's talk about your first book breaking the chains Tell yeah me about that um breaking the chains this is always the one breaking the chains of gravity i should use the proper title is always the one that i'm like it's a good book but i think fighting for space is more engrossing <laughs> um it's uh it was kind of my it's it really is the, the book that was uh kind of got me really excited about the era um because i love I love how things become what you know them to be. I love the prehistory. I love the, the story that comes before. Um, so it's a story of how NASA came to exist because I feel like we talk about NASA, we talk about the space age and the space race and people talk about it like NASA just kind of poofed into existence one day. 
and it just like started doing stuff and like it was it was 40 years in the making of like aviation and early aeronautical um research engineering all of this stuff biomedical so it's basically tracing all of the different facets of space flight and how they came together through second world war germany through various parts of the country different labs to create what we know as our space agency and it's this really interesting it's really interesting for me to look back and kind of understand just how deep the roots go that it's not just this like entity that has always been there that it was it was made by people who had to have the vision to actually look ahead, you know, people that were doing supersonic flight research in the 30s. People didn't, you know, it was 1947 that Jaeger finally flew faster than sound and level flight. You know, people did it in dives beforehand. And who knows if they, how many of them survived to tell the tale, but, um, you know, people doing this research almost 20 years before it became a reality and having that foresight really kind of pushed America into the space age. And I thought it's a fascinating history and stuff that we never talk about. I can't wait to read that one. I haven't, I haven't had the opportunity yeah. to read it, but it sounds fascinating. And you know, you have, a, a, there are, there's like a little tie between your YouTube channel and the um, Fighting for Space book that I want to talk about. So mm -hmm. you have this really great YouTube channel called The Vintage Space. And then you have Fighting for Space. And a couple of months ago, you posted this video about this backlash that you got from publishing this book. And I won't yeah. talk about that. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, so the Vintage Space, my, in my main YouTube channel, has always been about vintage space. Um, you know, Apollo era stuff, whether it's technical, whether it's history, whether it's personal, you know, whatever it is. And um, I, I love digging into those things. I'm, I'm not an engineer, you know, I, I come at it from a historian's perspective. But, you know, there, there is something to be said for that era of space flight really draws in people that you know, were mostly little boys who grew up watching it and love reliving it. And it is, you know, Listen, space is male dominated. History is still fairly male dominated. History that's like made of space is like super male dominated and they're like very protective of it. So like you make any error. I did, I did a video once where I trans, I, I translated, um, pounds into kilograms to discuss, you know, if, if this weighs, you know, X pounds on earth slash this many kilograms for non-Americans, it would be this many pounds on the moon slash this much kilograms. And people are like, well, actually you have to like, you need to do it in newtons because kilograms is a NASA doesn't change. And I'm just like, okay, <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay, that's stop. correct. Everybody just stop. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I'm like, okay, yes, you're technically. I'm correct. not an astrophysicist. I'm an historian. <laughs> But it's one of those things where I'm like, I'm not making videos for for academics. I'm making videos. I, I always describe it. I'm like, listen, if you stumble by my channel and you learn something and then you whip it out at pub trivia in two weeks, I'm happy. I'm making videos for the every man who has or the every person rather who has the interest in something passing and they move on. The people are so pedantic, it's unreal. So so not only, you know, I, I, that's kind of the environment that my channel exists in. So then when I come out with this book that's about women and that's more historically oriented and that's, you know, that's putting NASA maybe not in the best light, even though I think NASA is in a very neutral, very normal light in this book. Oh, blasphemy. So mad. They got so mad at me and I couldn't believe how many people, you know, and the thing is like, I'm, I'm self-employed. I've, I've been self-employed for going on 12 years at this point. I, I, you know, I'm an author. I do talks, I do TV interviews, I do events. And I have, I have actually two YouTube channels now, but you know, the main YouTube channel. So it's, it's a lot of things to do. And I could not do regular videos while I was writing that book. So I, you know, content was thin for a while. And then I came back promoting the thing that I spent four years of my life working on and the P and so many people, and it's always the vocal minority, but they're the ones that talk are like, wow, you've been away for a year and you just come back peddling your feminist agenda. Like just good. They, they just like wrote me off. Like my numbers went down and people, people were not shy about telling me that they were no longer supporting me because they didn't want to support a feminist agenda. And I'm sitting there like, have you been watching me for 10 years and not noticed that like, I am also a female, like what do, what do you think? And I've seen it every time I do a video that's about women and I never make the womanness the lead. It's, you know, like I want to talk about this pilot who did something amazing and, and her name was this. And I talk about it the same way I would talk about a male pilot. Just, it's just a pilot or an astronaut. And they get really, really mad. And they're like, oh, so you're one of those women channels now. It's like, no, I'm one of those history channels. And it's amazing that people see you, not everybody, 
but a lot of people see you do something about women and they assume that now you're just you're just a feminist and everything you do is going to be like because down with men I'm like I've literally my, my cat is named after a male astronaut like I'm not no I just I like people who do cool things I like people who achieve amazing things that's it that's what well, I want to just highlight. to be clear everyone yeah. this is a women's channel <laughs> And you men are welcome to enjoy it with us. And you men are welcome to be feminists right along with yeah. us. Because I'm a feminist. Yeah. I believe that women should have equal rights. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm yeah. so sorry that you went through that. I was so yeah. infuriated to see that for you. Because I appreciate how much work went into this. It's insane. No, oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's one of those things that, you know, it's it's not like, it's it feels like the open secret that female creators are hit with a lot of misogyny and a lot of stuff, but it's, it really is astounding. I've talked about it to, to you know, various audiences and colleagues that like, you know, a, a woman needs to take, a female creator needs to take a break for medical reasons and people just get mad that she hasn't done anything in a while. Whereas a male creator has, you know, car trouble and people just throw money at them to fix it. You know, there, there is this imbalance where, and I, I think, you know, I, I have data from various things that say, you know, women are considered warm and kind, but not trustworthy when it comes to science or anything technical. Um, on, on television, you see more male hosts because the predominantly male audiences of History Channel, Science Channel, Discovery Channel, they prefer to learn from a man, even if the woman is the expert. And it's it's a very real thing. And it's when you're when you're trying to kind of make make your living and make your space in um in male dominant fields and you, you are an expert in you know the things that you've done work in and you're still you're still not chosen for the jobs because they don't want to see a woman's face it's just like it's exhausting it just becomes oh. exhausting like at okay. what point right here sister <laughs> there <you go. laughs> We're with you. We it's, feel your yeah. pain. Yeah. I know. I know you guys I know you guys get it. It's just it is just like come on. I know. Come on. Uh, I don't know what to say to you. Just yeah. keep fighting no, the fight. And is. you are you are well you are so professional, so engaging and so mm -hmm. interesting. So everybody go check out our channel. But that's not the this this the vintage space is not your only thing. You've got this mm -hmm. new jam going on, which yeah. I saw as a writer, I totally geeked out on because you were like highlighting this um, punctuation that was like the question mark the exclamation bang. point. To, yeah. yeah, say it again. Yes, the, the interro bang. bang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, so, so one of the things I wanted to do on, you know, the, the idea of the vintage space was originally vintage space, but also a space for vintage things. Cause I, like I said, I love mid-century and how wild it was, but I can't, I can't do that on my main channel because people won't watch stuff that's not space there anymore. So I started a second channel, which is just my name, Amy Shearer title. And it's just all like a catch-all for weird mid-century stuff and history stuff that I love. Cause my, my background's actually in history. It's not in, in science. It's history of science, but you know, I'm a trained historian. So I did a video on the, on the interrobang a couple, few weeks ago, which is this really weird combination punctuation mark that was vogue in the sixties for like five years and never really took off. And I have a new video that I, I just, I do my own uh, animations on it, which is slow because I'm not an expert on this. Um, but I, I do working on a new video about the day Sweden decided to change driving sides from the left to the right. In oh, 19 that's got to be fascinating. 1967, <laughs> there were 2 million cars on the road and they were just like, all right, guys, September 3rd, switch. <laughs> it was it was <laughs> chaos. So, of course, you know, I want to know, like, why do we drive on the left versus the right? And it, it ends up being the story about, like, ancient Rome and the Ford Model T and Napoleon and all of this stuff feeds into why we drive on the left versus the right. And it's fascinating. So, like, I love digging in and that's that's what I do on my second channel. It's 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 up and coming, but it's fun. It's been a lot of fun. Oh, oh my gosh, I cannot wait to see that. I lived in, I had to do the right left thing because I lived in Barbados for a couple of years. And so that oh. was a really, I, I oh, still. It's, an, it's a former English colony. Yep. So oh, that's, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and, and so when I got back to the States, I still like to this day, the cars too are, you know, opposite, mm -hmm. including the hardest part for me. This is going to sound so silly, but it's like the blinker and the windshield wipers on the um. side of the steering wheel. And so to this day, I screw it up. I like flick the windshield wipers on when I'm yeah. trying to turn left. <laughs> yeah. How long did you live in Barbados? Because I feel like it takes... 
two years two and years, I'm still yeah. screwed up. But that's enough time to, cause I've only driven on the left once. It was in Australia for three hours. A friend of mine and I were driving through the, the bush. We drove from, from Byron Bay down to Sydney and I, you know what the thing for me was like, I'm sitting here and I'm used to looking up for the rear view mirror. And it was over here. And I realized like my eyes like hurt going this way because this is natural and this is not. And I had to, I've never been more aware of my mirrors in my life in those three hours. Oh, you know, they, so in flying, in flying, when you move into a new aircraft, mm -hmm. they call that negative transfer. You, okay. you bring in whatever habits you've learned in yeah. your aircraft to like, I'm a helicopter pilot. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I want to bring a fixed wing aircraft into a hover. That's a negative okay. transfer. Gotcha. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. That's not a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, so there's one more fun thing that you have going on yeah. that I, I, I tried really hard to get my son who's nine and yeah. who plays video games to like, right, hey, right, right. give me something fun to ask her about the Super Mario yeah. Brothers. Thing. So you're on Twitch as the yeah. Space Vixen. Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah, that that was a, a totally other a totally other venture, which has nothing to do with anything else except for the fact that I occasionally go on very impassioned rants about history. Um, but uh, yeah, it started it started um, like a lot of people during COVID. You know, things kind of slowed down for creators, and I looked for a way that was you know another path to to content creation. But I also you know, the backlash after people being so upset with me for publishing a book about women, I kind of wanted to do something where I could be more myself, not in presentation mode all the time, not scripted, just be a person. So my audience could get to know me as a person and maybe be like, oh, you are actually rounded and you're, you are someone that I can, you know, not just decide I hate one day. And um, video games are kind of, it's something, I mean, I play video games in the evenings to decompress anyways. And it seemed like a natural thing to just kind of like do that with an audience you know you're watching some gameplay but you're really there to chat and hang out and it's very social and it's it's such an interesting group i have my my audience my chat right now is like half gamers that i know from twitch a lot of we, we all play super mario world it's it's not just the original game it's like there's fan made games there's like thousands of these things we're not literally playing the same game every single day um but then I have, you know, I have these these guys in their 50s and 60s who've been following my career for for 10 years who come and hang out and they're like, I just I just really like hearing you talk off the cuff about your challenges as a creator, hearing you go on rants about, you know, why you loved this book and hated this book. And it's just it ends up being this like really interesting free space to just kind of exist. And the people who want to support you as a creator will come over and look. And, you know, a lot of people are put off by it because it is a very different thing that a lot of people aren't into. And I totally get it. That's why it's a different name and everything. But there are people who come in, they're like, it's it's nice to just like have a place to hang out a couple of nights a week and be social and get to know you a little bit more, which has been fun. It's been really fun. That's cool. And I think it's probably another way, like you mentioned, to broaden your audience because you can reach. Yeah. You, you know, so I just want to relate like um, I'm writing for young adults. So the yeah. first novel that I publish will be for a young adult audience. And so yeah. I recognize that I need to be on TikTok, uh, no, you know, if no. I'm going to connect with them. And I'm TikTok there. TikTok is so hard. No, I, but you know what is so funny? Just like space geeks, av geeks are fanatical. Yeah. And yeah. all I have to do, literally all I have to do is post a 15 second video of me, of, of, of an aircraft. And yeah. so, but the funny thing is like re okay. related to what you have, like, you know, I'm eventually would like to build a young adult audience yeah. for my channel, but I pretty much have every man over the age of 45 who is on TikTok, who is interested in aviation who follows me yes. <laughs> so yep. that's my audience it is. and that's cool because yeah. i'm over 45 and i love aviation and, and that's fine <laughs> and i'm not like no part of me is like i don't want the people who grew up with space i just want people i want to bring in more people and that's what i'm yeah. what i'm learning doing like the second youtube channel and you know th these strange history things and one thing you know be like i said i'm from canada and i'm i'm doing my own self-guided deep dive into american history because like 
what? There's so <laughs> much that like, I, I was not educated here, so I don't have any biases coming in. I'm just confused. Um, and, you know, I'm finding all these, these people in these different pockets who are interested in learning about these things. And I'm like, the more places you go and kind of discuss these things a little bit, the more people will kind of come in. So it really is, I feel like the, the challenge of, of, you know, reaching audiences as, a, as an author is trying to get, you have to be everywhere and you have yeah. to be like broadly appealing to people to bring them in from all sides. And it's a lot. TikTok is the weirdest one to get into because like, I don't uh, know. You would jam, like, I don't know what you're doing on TikTok. But I need to go, with, but you would jam on TikTok. Like they would love you. I, what, you know what I need to do more on TikTok is not feel like I have to edit everything. Cause right now it's, it's like little snippets from things that I just, you know, little moments that I think are fun or whatever, but I'm, I'm so, I feel so weird just like taking my phone and being like, and put a song over. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what to do. So I'm, I'm trying to yeah, figure out how to be more I'm comfortable with you on that. off the I, top recordings. I'm not the girl who's like going to be lip syncing to stuff. That's never going to happen yeah. with me. And yeah, yeah, I feel weird too. Like just talking into my phone to yeah, myself is very strange. Like, if you're, you know, if you're putting up a little video of a plane, like I would rather I'll film something and put it up, but I know I need to do me being like, did you guys know that this happened this day? This is me. And that feels so unnatural to me <laughs> still that I, I know I need to do that, but it's, That's it's so hard. funny, it especially as it. much as, as many videos as you've done. It's fun to hear that you are uncomfortable <laughs> with it too. Cause I definitely am. Yeah, no, I, I, I've been doing, I've been doing video for for 10 years now and I still wince when I turn the camera on and hate looking at myself, hate editing, I hate hearing my voice. I don't think that goes away. <laughs> okay, well, that's good to know. I'm here to tell you, give you positive reinforcement that you look great, you sound great, you sound professional and it's wonderful. Well, thank so you. we are gonna wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can check me out, Literary I'm, Aviatrix. I'm going to. On all of the things, I am literary aviator, nice. and you will be on my on my TikTok very soon. I will cut a portion of this and put it there as well, because nice. every every few videos, I I like sneak in an interview with an author just to yeah. you know like, hey guys, yeah. you can read these books. Yeah. They're pretty cool. <laughs> nice, nice. I like it. <laughs> so we're gonna wrap up this portion of the interview, which has been long, and so thank you for anyone who has lasted this long, but it's. This um, story is so fascinating and so good. And we're going to shift into talking a little bit more writing after maybe a little uh, bathroom break. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but um, I just want to make sure people know where to find you. So remind us. Um, the best places to find me. I'm Amy Shira Title on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, and also YouTube. And my main YouTube channel, which if you Google my name will come up, it's called The Vintage Space, which is the more space history. And actually what I, I have to write it, but uh, I do have a series that I'm working on about all of the uh, X-Planes. I have a 13 part series about X-Planes, which is coming up and I'm super excited because they're so cool. So yeah, Amy, I'm excited about that too. And, and hold on, before we wrap this up, uh, did you have another book in progress? Um, I do that I'm not talking about yet because okay. I actually, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, you know, when you're in early stages and you don't have any kind of anything in place yet, I have something that I'm working on, but okay. it'll exist in my mind for a while. <laughs> okay. I can't wait to hear about it. Yeah. Well, Amy, thank you so much for this book. It's fascinating. It's well-written. It's engaging. Okay. And thank you for your time talking about this. And I look forward to talking to you about writing in the next portion. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much for joining and join us next month in the Aviatrix Book Club when we'll discuss the book Under the Radar, a Taking Risks novel by Sandy Parks. Blue skies and happy reading. Ready to go again. I'm ready to say.